chilling winds and unforgiving Arctic waters washing the shore. Mental picture there. Kotelny Island might not sound like a go-to destination, but it's where Russia's Navy has now arrived to help complete the restoration of a long-abandoned Soviet military base. And it's going to be no easy makeover either, as Murad Gazdiev has been finding out. If there was a difficulty setting for life on Earth on Kotelny Island, you'd find it turned up all the way to hardest. Howling wind, merciless cold and its sheer remoteness have conspired to make Kotelny a barren wasteland the sort you'd expect to see in a post-apocalyptic movie, one in which they went over the top with props. Barrels! And the problem isn't just hundreds or thousands of barrels, the problem is tens of thousands of barrels strewn everywhere across the islands. Some in ordered stacks like this, but most thrown about at random. Now, this is a problem inherited from the Soviet Union, from days back when pollution and climate change just weren't issues as serious as they are today. Originally, they all carried fuel, which is vital to survive the brutal winters here. Authorities are brainstorming over how to clear up the mess, but any solution is bound to cost a pretty penny. The island, of course, has to be cleared of useless junk, and somehow the barrels must be utilized, which will require additional resources and funds. But, as the saying goes, one man's junk is another's treasure. Filled with sand, the barrels become an excellent alternative to sandbags, and the troops are already fortifying the island with them. Stack them up, and you get a solid wall that acts as a much-needed windbreak. Cut them up and put them back together, and if you're any good, you might even end up with a water boiler like this. After all, the troops have plenty of incentive. We've organized a sort of competition between the squads here, and the winners are announced daily. We've already formed a community, and the atmosphere is great. The boys are really trying. Even the cooking here is extreme. This is the little kitchen that serves the garrison troops. And uh, while it smells amazing, it is cold here. It is absolutely freezing. It's snowing, although the sun is out. But uh, according to the people here, according to the troops here, from what they've told us, the only way to keep yourself from getting too cold is to just keep working. The troops are set for the coming winter in terms of supplies and housing. And they have to be, given that they could be unreachable for months. But it's up to the officers now to prepare the men psychologically for a year guarding the northern frontier, all but cut off from civilization. Morad Gazdiev, RT, Kotelny Island. A remote and forbidding Arctic island, home only to a weather station and the odd polar bear, is about to become a bustling military base. That's because Russia is boosting its naval presence in the region. Artij Murad Gazdiev was among the first new arrivals. The island of Kotelny looks like a barren wasteland, and that's because it is. Alien may be the best word to describe a landscape that looks eerily like you'd imagine the surface of Mars. There's not a tree nor a shrub in sight. One of the major features of the island of Kotelny is its sheer hostility to life. Much of the island is made up of this, rocks and pebbles, and just a few meters below us is permafrost, as it never gets warm enough here to properly thaw out. But that hasn't stopped man. While the island was abandoned by the Soviet military decades ago, a remote meteorological station stayed on. <coughs> The station team was overjoyed to host the rear admiral. There aren't many visitors up here. A pack of dogs greeted us at the helicopter pad. The first and best line of defense against curious polar bears, affectionately called mishkas, who wander in from time to time. The polar bears here only pretend to be scared of the dogs, but they do leave? Eventually. They aren't scared of one dog, but the pack surrounds them, confuses them, and eventually they run away back into the tundra. After lunch, Igor showed us one of the island's treasures, a mammoth's tusk. Apparently there's been a real problem with mainlanders coming in and setting up illegal dig sites. He was also happy that the Russian military was back company at last. This is the new home of the 99th Arctic Tactical Group, which will be stationed here on the island of Kotelny permanently. Now, their accommodations for now, they may look humble, and they are, but big things are expected on this island. Just to our right, a new runway is being paved, while a few kilometers to the north, an entire city is being brought up to house the military. 
An army of construction workers and equipment have been brought into the island, and they've got their work cut out for them. There are no roads, no infrastructures to speak of. It really is one rough ride. This is normal for Arctic latitudes. The conditions are of course harsh, but we're coping. We've got the food, the equipment, so we'll survive just fine. Moscow's sparing no expense on its Arctic projects, much like Canada, America and other nations contending for the North Pole. But while Russia's icebreaker fleet and experience in the Arctic give it an edge, Nothing's being left to chance. Morad Gazdiev, RT, Katelny Island. And you can follow Morad's tour of duty on his day-to-day -day blog at rt.com. Just a few hundred kilometers north of here, the Arctic begins. Its sheer, merciless cold has largely kept man out so far, but that's now changing. The ice is melting, and the immense treasures it hid are now being revealed. Join us here on RT as we journey to the North Pole with the Russian fleet and see it all firsthand. As the Arctic sea ice melts away at an alarming rate, access to vast oil reserves is opening up and countries bordering the region are determined to defend their their slice of the pie. The polar seabed may hold as much as 15% of the world's undiscovered oil and 30% of its natural gas. But as RT's Marina Portnaya found out, the battle for the region could take a dangerous turn. Melting ice caps in the Arctic have ignited a military buildup over the world's smallest ocean and the raw riches buried beneath it. The Arctic Circle is believed to contain 30% of the world's undiscovered natural gas and 15% of its oil. The future of the world economy to some extent is dependent on the Arctic and I think you know Russia and Canada, the United States and Norway and Denmark are very interested uh, in exploiting these resources. Last month Canada abruptly claimed that it owned the North Pole while the United States with its Alaskan outpost has plans to boost its military there claiming it lacks operational experience and needs to police the thinning ice as it's replaced by fuel filled maritime traffic. But that's not all. Actually, U.S. submarines are deployed not too far away, off the Norwegian coast. It would take U.S. missiles 16 to 17 minutes to get from there to Moscow. So we really hope that with all the things that have been happening in the world over the past few decades, we have put the Cold War confrontation behind us. In all, five countries bordering the Arctic have sovereign rights to resources within 200 nautical miles of their territorial waterways. But a growing appetite for a bigger slice of the pie is what many fear can inevitably spark a 21st century Cold War in the frozen waters. There are also unexplored resources that we don't know yet to which country belongs, which could be, of course, of, of interest to many countries. I do think that smaller things could spark uh, both tension and, and maybe more tension that we would like to see. Marina Portnaya, RT, New York. We heard earlier from Christopher Perry, a strategic forecaster and former British naval officer. He thinks clashes are inevitable in the race for the Arctic. Where I think we could have some disputes is there are a number of other interested uh, countries such as India, uh, China, Korea, uh, Japan, all getting very interested not just in the northern sea route but also in the resources that exist uh, up there and in the Arctic. Already the Chinese are, uh, are operating in Greenland and places like that and I think there will be a scramble by some of the other countries for some of those resources. When the ice does recede, so you're not just going to have the northern sea route across the top of Russia and the northwest passage across Canada, you're also going to have a route around 2050 straight across the top of the North Pole. Now that means that uh, the countries uh, that in the past have faced each other across the North Pole, that icy waste, are going to have open water uh, for quite a few months of the year and that will introduce different perspectives, different geometries. To the, you're going to see Canada uh, and the United States also entering uh, into the Arctic. So it's going to be an interesting situation from a strategic point of view, probably around 
2045, 2050. But people will be getting ready for that, of course, in the years leading up to that. Before that, the US is closely watching Russia's moves in the Arctic, where economic riches are attracting military interest. That's according to Washington's top diplomat. The potential there is already there for a global race to exploit the resources of the region. Artie Zagor Piskanov was listening in on John Kerry's speech and has more. Well, first of all, let's look at this potential. Uh, the total amount of resources, the estimated amount that it's believed that the Arctic contains is quite impressive. We're looking at about 13% of uh, global oil reserves or one third of the world's gas reserves. And judging by what the U.S. Secretary of State said, perhaps not only the potential is already there. He was talking about how Russia planted a flag uh, on, the, on a part of the Arctic Sea. The continental shelf that uh, Russia says is a part of its territory. He was also talking about how China has been uh, very active uh, recently in the Arctic region, developing gas, oil and uh, fishing there as well. The question is, do these announcements coming from uh, Mr. Kerry, do they mean that the United States may be looking at uh, joining this possible race? And if so, then to what extent? Let's listen to what Mr. Kerry had to say. Economic riches tend to attract military interest as nations seek to ensure their own rights are protected. Well, actually, Washington has been a bit more diplomatic uh, previously. We'll just listen to what uh, Mr. Obama said about uh, the Arctic region just last August. Uh, to all uh, the foreign dignitaries who are here, I want to be very clear. We are eager to work with your nations on the unique opportunities that the Arctic pre uh, presents and the unique challenges that it faces. So the rhetoric uh, is quite different, but frankly, words are words and action is action. And even before that uh, statement by uh, the U.S. president, uh, Washington took part in, the, in large military drills with other NATO countries in the Arctic region. Well, judging by the impressive amounts of the resources which are believed to, uh, to be contained in the Arctic, I think it's pretty fair to expect that global interest to that region will only grow in the future. And it's very unlikely that the United States will be willing to uh, miss out on a piece of that pie.